We are to have you with us. So take your hymn books, turn to 614, 614. When you find your spot, stand with me as we open our service with I Shall Know Him. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His Son be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view His blessed face and the luster of His kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise Him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepares me for a mansion in the sky. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, He will lead me where no tears shall ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Good to see everybody this morning. Good to be in God's house together. Good to have our visitors. I hope you all enjoy the service and are made to feel at home today. Just good to be here today. I appreciate Sunday school this morning. appreciate those of you that uh, made it to Sunday school this morning. Let's go ahead with a word of prayer. And we've got a couple of announcements. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us today, O oh God. Lord, we're needy people. Lord, we stand before you with great needs in our lives and, and in our hearts, God, in our homes. Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to us today. I pray that you'd meet with us and work in our midst this morning. God, if we meet here without your power and presence, Lord, we might as well shut the doors and go home. But God, I pray that you'd meet with us and help us today. God, I pray that each song sang, Lord, that we would sing it out of a spirit, of, out of a spirit and heart of worship. God, I pray in the preaching time, God, that you'd help me to preach truth, that we'd intently listen to what saith the Lord. God, help us today, meet with us, be with those that could not be here. Lord, I pray that you'd work in the heart of those that just chose not to be here. God, meet with us and help us. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Brother Tony and his family in a difficult time. Lord, I pray for others that are in dark spots in life and troubling times. God, help them. But here and now, I pray that you'd work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, uh, so again, it's good to see each of you here today. If you're visiting with us the first time, if you'd fill out one of the Connect cards in the back of the pew for us, leave it in the little box on the back table there. We'd appreciate it if you're comfortable doing that. Just whatever information you're comfortable giving us, we share with you. And I want to welcome also those that might be listening by way of live stream today. 
I just got a couple of announcements this morning. First of all, I want to say, Brother Tony, uh, I appreciate you sharing that and everything with me and all. We'll be praying for you. His mother, we've had on the prayer list for some time, passed away. Uh, did you say Friday? Did you say, okay, and uh, this text will be today from 3 to 5. I, I think you said it, 3 to 5 at Fairhaven. And then the service will be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at Fairhaven if you're able to attend that. If not, certainly pray for them in a tough time. Also pray for Miss Sharon. She's at home under uh, hospice care. They're keeping her comfortable. And uh, we spent some time with them yesterday, and some of the family was kind of telling Sharon some funny stories and all, and, and she's not really responded in, in a couple of weeks almost. And, and all, but it just seems to me one time they told a funny story on her from time, and I tried to look at it, and it just looked like she had a smile on her face. But uh, saved. She knew, knew the Lord, knows the Lord. Just pray for her in this time of her life and for the family during a, during a tough time. Got a lot of others on a prayer list, y'all. You'll see in your bulletin we put an a insert in there. Uh, I know being a church and all that, we can't go tell you who to vote for and all. However, those on the other side will have those candidates in and advertise those individual candidates and all that. We can't, can't show you who, show, who stands for wickedness and who does not. And Christians ought not vote for wickedness. I don't see how a Christian could vote for wickedness, but we have a clear choice this time, and here's some little bit of information on the, some of the issues and more the moral issues that they stand for or stand against, so please vote uh, on the 8th, vote your convictions, vote, vote scripturally, vote biblically, and, um, but anyhow, I want to mention that as far as announcements, I do want to mention that this is 5th Sunday, so the night service will be different, and I, I don't ever plan on coming to church not getting up here talking about something for a few minutes, but so we'll have a little short. I'll give you a little short charge from the Word of God for just a minute, and then we'll have a mostly song service tonight and, spe- you know, maybe a couple extra specials and everything. I'll just turn that over to Brother Bryant. They run out like he'd like to. So if we can sing a third verse in some of those songs, brother, if it's good and God could use it, man, why, why say two verses? Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> Now, if it's dead and all that, just go to, cut it off at one. Cut off at one. <laughs> no, but I, I enjoy good singing. Hey, singing is biblical. It's scriptural. And if we sing right, we're singing to worship the Lord. Amen. Uh, but anyway, I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, Tuesday morning, ladies, Bible study here at church at 1030. Uh, you do not have to be a, a member of the church for that, but you do have to be a lady. And uh, but So that's 1030, Tuesday mornings. Uh, and, uh then I want to mention, let me back up and mention Sunday school. Uh, that's, that's part of our service. If you're a member, you're expected. You ought to be here. And please be here. You're missing a blessing. You, you're, not being, you're missing part of the family, and part of the family activity. So please be here if you would, and if you could, and visitors, we'd sure love for y'all to see y'all next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock here at Sunday school. Uh, I do want to mention the... Uh, of course, Wednesday night, the bus runs in the neighborhood. Tell, tell children about that. Invite children. Get in touch with us. We'll get them a ride on the van. Wednesday night, for Kids for Truth. Of course, we have a regular service out here and concentrate more towards prayer and our prayer list at the end. November 5th, trunk or treat. Uh, all the home folk know about it and everything. I do want to mention this. I don't know how much of, of course, there'll be a chili cook-off after that. After 530, we'll come back in the fellowship hall and have a chili cook-off and competition and some fun and fellowship and food and all that. Uh, but I do want to mention, this is not a Halloween festival, it's not a Halloween carnival, it hasn't got anything to do with Halloween, Halloween's tomorrow, I know the roots of it, the pagan activity and all that, and, and I understand that, little children that, are, that grow up in the world we live in don't know that, they don't understand that, they may show up with their costumes and witches and goobl- goobl- goblins, ghouls and goblins and goblins and all that stuff, or NASCAR drivers or policemen or whatever they might wear, and that's fine. But we're not, our decorations on our cars and the things we do shouldn't be towards how things of Halloween. They will not be towards the things of Halloween. Let me clear that up. Uh, turn them in opportunities to witness and share the gospel. And uh, keep that in mind that we'd be not, there's not a Halloween carnival or about that. It's more of a fall festival. But, uh, call it trunk or treat. Get the children in. Give them some candy. Give them the gospel. Invite them to church. And love them, just show them some good Christian love and, of course, a good time of fellowship for all of us. If you hadn't chosen your games or decided what you can do, please make sure to do so this week and be prepared uh, well before Saturday and have an idea of what we're going to be doing. 
uh, so we'd come across professional, like to know what we're doing and care. Uh, November 6th, December, daylight saving time next week. Fall backwards, okay? So set those clocks. And I can't never figure out if you'll be late or early and hope I don't ever find out. But I know there's always a crowd that gets here an hour early or gets an hour late because they forgot. Deck the halls November 20th. We'll talk more about that in time coming up. Y'all be praying for these, praying for the Ray family, praying for Miss Sharon and all the others. And that's all as far as announcements and all this morning. Brother Bryant, come lead us in a couple of good songs, brother. I, I had to think about what you meant by the third verse. Oh, oh, and I was yeah. like, what is he? And we, we sing the third verse on a lot. This yeah. verse. But it, on, on Fifth Sunday, we usually sing the first and last verse of the song you'd pick, unless you prefer different verses or whatnot. So that's what it meant. So, yeah, well, I mean, a number three. So somebody, not the third please verse, yeah. tonight pick the third verse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just pick it. Take your hymn books, turn to 278, 278 at Calvary. Sing out with me on the first. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I'd learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. So when choosing these songs, uh, I, I do sometimes I choose less verses than what the whole song has. Um, some are not as familiar to us, but this song, it seemed like the message of each verse is kind of hard to skip any verses. So um, you got stuff on your mind. You got stuff on your heart. I understand. But just for a few moments, and meaning until about 12, 12, 15, put those things aside. Amen. And, and let's, as you sing these words, uh, try to think about it. I have to remind myself to smile sometimes because I'm, I'm in front of you guys. But uh, I'm also trying to think, like last song, I, uh, I missed a word, threw you off. <laughs> so I'm concentrating on things like that. But think about these words as you're singing them as a, as a point of worship. Amen. At Calvary, you know, the things that Jesus did for us at Calvary, these are not, these are not inspired. This is not Holy Spirit breathed. The Word of God is. But Amen. boy, these have some great principles and truths that we can sing and worship. So think about these words as we get into the third verse and then the fourth and just be thankful for what he did for us at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. That drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to men. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. At Calvary. Amen. Amen. And then the last song for our congregational singing this morning, 392. 392, when you find your spot, stand with me if you can as we sing Rock of Ages. Rock. 
rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for rest. Full I go to fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. You may be seated. That's my testimony that I can do what God wants me to do. And I just am so thankful that God gave me the talent to see. And I know sometimes that I break down, but it's because I love him so much. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. Thank you. All right, children, y'all are dismissed at this time.
I'll turn your Bibles to John chapter 10 this morning. John chapter 10. You know, that's a powerful song. I don't know if you listen to the words or not, but uh, I just, it just sums it up like this. If, if it ain't in the name of Jesus, it ain't worth doing. And everything worth doing, praise God for it and lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to get me a tie like that next week. That's sharp, ain't it? I like that. John chapter 10. Stand with me in reverence to the Word of God, if you would, if you're able. If you're not, I understand. Certainly the Lord understands. I'm going to read a little more than I usually do sometimes. I'll only read one verse and sit down and read the remainder, but I want to read it all. Not the whole chapter, but a few verses. John chapter 10, starting verse 1. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them not out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. Of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Let me read verse 9 again. I am the door. By me, if any man shall enter in, or, uh, I put a shall in, it's not there. But anyway, he, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. In verse 9 says, I am the door. In verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is, that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, I have, which are not of this fold, them I must bring, and shall hear my, uh, they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, and I might take it again. Well, power of the resurrection, Amen. Verse 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Look at verse 10. The Bible says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Notice it says, I am. Make no mistake, this is the same I am that said, told, that told Moses, said, uh, the I am sent you. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So often we as Christians are wandering around, beaten down by the cares of this life, and often fail to walk in the light as he would have us to walk in the light. And then there's people that are good people by man's standards, who don't know Jesus, and they're continually searching for answers, for peace, and for life. Either case, it's kind of like a, 
kind of like a good hot fudge brownie without the ice cream. It's just not complete without that ice cream. I want to preach this morning a few minutes, and I beg your attention, please, not because of me or anything me, but because of the Word of God and truth. But I want to preach on abundant life this morning. Let's pray. Father, I love you, Lord. God, we thank you for loving us first. God, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, mercy, peace, grace, all that you give us. Lord, I thank you for the truths of this passage. Lord, you lay down your life for us. Lord, you speak to us and allow where we can hear you. God, help us this morning. Help me to preach truth. Lord, I know there's some here this morning that a lot of us probably that are not walking as close as we ought with you. God, I pray that you'd work in your heart in our hearts through this message. Lord, we'd be drawn closer to you. Lord, there might even be someone here today that's never trusted you as Savior. Lord, somebody that's lost. God, I pray that you'd work in their heart Lord, that the day might be their day of salvation, that they turn to you. God, help me to preach truth. Again, I pray, Lord, you'd work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to go back and read verse 10 again. There's so much I'd like to say about the passage, uh, and I will several verses. We'll kind of look at them in a little bit more depth. I'll I will say about verse 16, though. I'm not preaching from verse 16. We'll uh, mention it and pass it through in a minute, but it says that other sheep. I know there's religious groups that claim that that other sheep is theirs, and God revealed some truth to them 150 years ago, and they're a special little coddled group and all that, and that's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't buy that. But, it, but I'll give you some reference on that, that other sheep in Isaiah 49, verse 6, and Isaiah 56, verse 8 if you would write those down, Isaiah 50, 49, verse 6, and Isaiah 56, verse 8, will tell you if you don't already know, but it's talking about Gentile. He came into his own, his own received not, and as they, uh, as the Jews rejected Christ when he came, there's a time that he, at this point, they blinded their eyes, and they're blind to this day. It does not mean they cannot get saved. It just means in their dead Judaism of religion, they missed their Messiah when he came. They, he came to his own, they received him not, and they're blinded nationally for a season. He's not done with them. We've not replaced them. Replacement theology is so badly mistaken. We have not replaced Israel. We are the church. Israel is Israel. This is the day of grace that God is working in the local church and in the church through the body of Christ, through mostly of Gentile uh, origins, I guess we could say, that other fold, that other sheet that he has. And God will one day deal nationally with Israel when he comes back. And also, I just want to clear that up in verse 16, so many false teachings on that. But verse 10 is what I want to preach on this morning, uh, predominantly, and, and there, there about that passage. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, I am, I am come that, I might, that you, they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10 there, our, our passage there has really three parts to it. And I want to break that down and talk about that a little bit this morning. The beginning of it starts off, it says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Remember this passage is a, uh, this par- is a parable, it was given uh, a parable of sheep and a shepherd and the principles there of the, and look back at a time that we don't really probably understand in the fullness of the time when it was written and when Jesus spoke these words to those around him at the time that he spoke this as it was more common the sheep being uh, you know prominent and so many people having sheep and she- they had to be shepherded they had to have people and they weren't all fenced in and they had shepherds that led them out and led them around and they 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 knew his voice, they knew his commands, and they'd bring them back into the sheepfold. And, but there was always false shepherds. There was, uh, there was pro- people that came in, their intention, and there was wolves uh, that came about that would steal the uh, sheep, that would damage the sheep, would kill the sheep. So it's kind of hard maybe for us to understand this in the principle on that side of it because we're not used to sheep farming here. Now, well, if we had a sheep farm in here today, they'd probably get it as far as the physical side of this pretty well. But on the spiritual side, we ought to all get it, hadn't we? 
But, but anyway, there, number one says, there, for, I mean, part A of this is a thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Thieves and robbers, verse, uh, verse 1 uh, let's, let's look at verse 1. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Look at verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And then look at verse 10. Again, it said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill. So we got thieves and robbers. Who, who, are, who are thieves and robbers? Well, they're uh, I say there's Satan's workers. Uh, there's workers of iniquity. There's false, false shepherds, Satan's workers. There's false prophets, false teachers. And I, in its context, I think it's more uh, the, the, the point there, the context there to the crowd deliver. Now, we can take it and apply it different in, in different scenarios in our life and those around us now. But teachers of, if we want to be careful, I use the word, but teachers of religion that are hoarding religion over their head and and carrying on, promoters of work salvation. And it said that in, in, in the parable, it's just that. They come in and they trick the sheep. The, I, I mean, I guess if, we'd named, if we had to name a name here that it's talking about of the thieves and robbers, it'd be the, uh, it'd be the scribes and the Pharisees. Those that had taken the law of Israel, the law of God, in those 400 years of silence that they'd uh, had since the last uh, writings of the Old Testament, since God had worked through prophets on, in the land at that time, they had 400 years, and man, they took that thing. They took the writings of the Old Testament, the law, and, and they added to it. They took 10 commandments and made about 1,000 out of them. And man, they were uh, walking around looking down their long noses because they were a little better than everybody around them. And they didn't do that like, the, like I do, so something must be wrong with you and you've got to do this, you've got to do that. When Jesus came on the scene, on the scene boy, he rocked their apple cart, didn't he? He came on, on Sabbath day, he'd heal, he'd do works unto God for God's glory on the Sabbath day. Everywhere he went about doing great things, there was always a crowd walking around with a checkbook and, and, and uh, man, I, I see this in ministry now, people walk up, you do something, feel like Lord led to do something, somebody come and say, you, did you do that? I can't believe you did that. Well, I didn't ask you. The Lord told me to do it. I'm not going to ask you permission what the Lord tells me to do. Amen? But, but there's those, those, those uh, for scribes and Pharisees, man, they took what God meant for good. They took the law, which was a schoolmaster, and Jesus was foreshadowed in those things in the Old Testament. They took that and they ran it and turned it into a whole religion that was a religion of, of just, uh, there was no winners in, in the law. There was no winners in, in their salvation, their work salvation. Follow me and do as I do. That slipped into the shadows. Listen to this. I use the phrase that the Old Testament, the law was foreshadows of Christ and things to come. But they had slipped in the shadows of the coming Messiah and came forth out of the shadows as their own light. They robbed the people of the joy of their joy of walking with God. And man, think about, about I think about Job. I, I love the beginning verses of Job. There was a man in the land of us. He, walked, he was a perfect man. He walked uprightly, eschewed evil. Man, Job walked with God. He knew what it was like. He wasn't stained up by man's religion and taking all the points of the law and trying to apply them and walk so rigid and scared to death that he's scared that God would reach through to heaven with a hammer and bop him in the head if he missed one mark. And, and they, they turned it into just a, a, a religious mess. Thieves and robbers. And by the way, they're all around us today. In many shapes, foreign fashions, many are standing in a white building. Well, it may not be a white building on the outside, but, but anyway, uh, I said that because ours is a traditional white building on the outside, the painting or vinyl siding. Uh, but, but nonetheless, they may stand in a building that looks like a traditional building or non-traditional. It may or may not have a cross. Probably has a sign out front that says something, something church or, or gathering place of some sort or some type. And there's somebody standing behind a pulpit today that's not inspired of God, not, not, not inspired, not, not called of God. Uh, they're hirelings. That's the next point. But they're, they're thieves and robbers. They're putting things on men that God, that God has not asked for men to do or say uh, outside of trusting in him and walking with him. And they're trying to lord over these people over God's heritage. 
And they're keeping them down rather than let them walk and live and desiring that they live an abundant life for Christ. Well, anyway, there's thieves and robbers. Then there's the hirelings. Look at verse, uh, I got to change my page. Hold on just a second. Verse 12 and 13 says, But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. Whoa. That's a tough passage. Careth not for the sheep. But this thieves and robbers, then hirelings, who are these? They're they that preach for their own interest. In the context of the scribes and Pharisees, everything was about their own interest, that they'd make people do like they wanted them to do. They'd make people act like they acted. And, and, and you rest assured, they probably didn't stand on the street corner and call out people for things that they hadn't conquered yet, for it was about them, not about the Word of God and God's glory and the coming Messiah that they rejected. But hirelings are those that preach for their own interest. It may be money, and I've seen them, seen them on TV, turn into the prosperity gospel, but they wanted you rich where you could send them more money. But they're not just on TV, they're in pulpits across this land. Might be for money. Now, I know there's principles of money and the ministry and all that, but that ain't this, today's message and all that. But, but boy, there's, there's preachers, man, that's, that's in it for the money. They're in it for fame. Man, they'll put their picture anywhere they can get it. They want to go. Now, I want my name and my, my face and my wife's face associated in some kind of way with Hardison Baptist Church. When I, when I, and, and that, but I ought not be because I put it on billboard signs across the country. I'm not saying that's always a wicked thing. But when I go in fresh way and we go in there, uh, I want it to be a, a happy couple that represents Hardison Baptist Church. By the way, your faces ought to be represented and associated with Hardison Baptist Church, too. When you go in Freshway or you go in whatever store around here, I love Freshway. I love that meat counter. Amen. Especially that little smoke thing. That's mine up front by the deli. That little octagon-shaped smoke thing with that smoked meat. That, oh, man, if the whole place burns, somebody get that smoked meat out of there. But we ought to, we ought to, our faces ought to be associated with it, not about something other, some other motive, not that we're self-promoting, that we're about ourselves, but I'm talking about hirelings, those that are, that are their service. For God, it doesn't have to be pastors and preachers. It can be uh, people in the church and their service that uh, everything they do is about their own self-promotion. And y'all look at me, how great I am. And, and we talked about that the other day on Silent Servants. I preached about Wednesday night. Folks that are everything's about them, that everybody would see what they do rather than our works be about promoting uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the furtherance of the kingdom. Maybe about money, maybe about fame, maybe about glory of their own or power. And it don't take you long to see those that are power hungry. But everything they do is not for the sake of the gospel and the furtherance of the kingdom. They're, they're those, those hirelings are not God's appointed shepherds or under shepherds. As Christ was speaking of himself being the true shepherd and God the Father is perfect will. God the Son came and bore our sin on Calvary, but he was about seeking who might, the lost that might, they might get saved, wasn't he? And several times he pointed the glory back to the Father. I think of David, there, but there are those that are appointed that it's not their Sheep, but they're appointed to watch over. And I think about that as the in the Old Testament we see that more. But David would be a good example, uh, watching over the sheep. There's an under shepherd now. Uh, and, and Acts twenty, uh, verse twenty eight. There, when uh, Paul was addressing the the elders from the churches of Ephesus. And they'd come and met him at Melita there, and they gathered around, and he couldn't get to them, so they came to him as. He's headed back to, back to Rome, excuse me. Start to say Jerusalem. But one of the things he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the, the Holy Ghost made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. 
So we know from that passage that there are uh, the, the shepherds that are not hirelings, but they're the God called shepherds as they were at that time in the law. And under the law, God had the, his, uh, the, the judges, the kings, even though they didn't all follow after God, and the, uh, the prophets and all, they, uh, it wasn't there. Israel wasn't theirs, but they were in his, their charge by God. But they have charge and responsibility of the sheepfold. But then there's back to the thought of the hirelings, that those that are in it for their own interest in the time and the context, those scribes and Pharisees, it was all about self and that others see them and know them, see what they do. But those hirelings in the pulpits today, a lot of them are career day preachers. I remember career days at school. Y'all remember that? They'd have maybe a, a fire truck and some little children would go around, gather around the firemen and learn the great things they do, rescuing people and all. And, and probably a lot of little children saw that and they, they went up that day and, and uh, maybe even Christian children, Lord impressed that all your life I'm going to use you and one day you're going to be a fireman. You're going to serve God by helping people. Might be someone went by a police booth and, and they saw they help people and they protect people. And they chose that day in and, and, and different booths and all. I remember different company, companies would represent themselves. We'd go and talk to them about a career in their field and all. And unfortunately, those would say, well, you know what, for a career, I think one day, I think I'm going to get into ministry. You know, they, you, you, you know some, there's no joke about preaching three times a week for uh, whatever amount of money or whatever, I'm going to tell you what, I do this part for free. It's that other part and phone calls and visits and those, those hard times and putting out those fires is those things you pay me for, but you don't pay me. You take care of my needs according to the will of God and I'm to serve whether you do or don't. Amen. But the career day preachers, they won't last long. They'll blow out. Those that ask to preach, I've had preach, you spell fellow, he's gone now. Uh, he used to would call me time to time, and, and uh, I'm not going to try to imitate his voice because somebody might pick up on who I'm talking about, but he'd say, hey, I'm going to be in town for a little period of time, and I just want to know if, uh, if I can come by and, and be a help your people there. I'm going to be in town. and let me know. He might call me six months out, and then a few weeks in, going to make an appointment to come preach. I'm sorry, but I don't work that way. If the Lord nudge me to use you, I'll use you, brother, but you're not inviting your way into my pulpit. I'm sorry. If you want a paycheck, why don't you just say, give me $100, I'll give you $100. But don't use my paycheck for a source of a pulpit. I mean, source of a paycheck. Ooh, y'all get quiet. <laughs> they ask to preach, they advertise their ministries. Ultimately, though, when the hireling, and I was speaking more in the light of evangelists that may not have a full schedule, trying to fill that schedule and things like that, and and all, but and I, and I realize now. Let me take. Let me clear this up. I don't have a problem with a missionary that's got a meeting at Mikado on July the second a.m. service and said, "Brother, I'm gonna be in the way. Can I come present my ministry to your people that evening? Because he's gonna be here. That's different. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about those that perhaps God hadn't called them. They're trying to line up paychecks." Boy, I've spent a lot more time on these thieves and robbers and hirelings than I meant to. But part B, there's the thieves and robbers. So the verse says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then it says, I am come that they might have life. Now, this is where I want to spend more focus here. I'm, I spend a lot of time on that because there's so many false lights, false prophets, and, and, and uh, men and whoever, whatever gender in the pulpit uh, that God did not call their, uh, up for their own purpose and all. But there are true shepherds and under-shepherds, but ultimately God is the shepherd and Jesus is the shepherd and the true shepherd. It says, I am come that they might have life. You know, I don't know if y'all, if any of y'all ever seen the play called Born to Die. It's put out by, I forget the name of the ministry over there with Bob Jones. Uh, awesome play, wonderful play. But it's the truth. I mean, it's the ultimate truth that Jesus was born to die. For me and for you, for our sins. I am come that they might have life. He died a substitutionary death for our sin. He that knew no sin became our sin that day. 
And we, by faith, may be freed from our sin by trusting his payment and trusting him and turning to him. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Realizing and believing that his payment on the cross paid our sin debt. And when a sinner is saved, is given eternal life. John 5, 24. I love that verse. So much doctrine, so much truth, so much is just summed up in one verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation and is passed from death unto life. He says, I am come that they might have life. And can I remind you, there's no life through anybody else other than Jesus Christ. Any other that claims to give life outside of Jesus Christ is a hireling. He's a thief or a robber. And is a deceiver and a liar. So we know that when a lost person trusts Christ for salvation, there shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So by that, we, so we understand that a lost person and we learned it from back in the Bible, they followed, they disobeyed God and brought about death. In the book of Romans, chapter 7, 8, 9, spends a lot of detail in other places of the Bible talking about that because Adam fell. Adam was created in, per, in perfection. I don't say he was the first Jesus, but Jesus is called the second Adam. It was like God sent, put man here in perfection and made them free moral agents and let them choose and they failed him and disobeyed him and separated man from holy God. But then the second Adam came in perfection just like Adam came. But he came without sin, the son of God, the incarnate God. God took on a body, the Bible teaches. Walked on the face of earth 33 and a half years with no sin nature, therefore no sin. And he died because he knew that we were separated from God from that sin way back yonder. You say, well, I'm not, I don't have anything to do with Adam. Well, you may think you don't, but you do. But even if you didn't, we're all sinners by choice at some age. We call it the age of accountability. Uh, it's got, there's a tie of nakedness and sin in the Bible. And about the time people realize nakedness is a problem, is a, probably a pretty good indicator of their knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve themselves, nakedness wasn't even brought about and thought about or nothing like that until they disobeyed God. And then they became, that was their age of accountability, if I can use that phrase right there. And from then on, they, what they do? They tried to cover their nakedness. God said, oh, no, not that easy. It takes shed blood to do it. Little children run around the house naked as a jaybird. I better skip through this part pretty quick here, but just realize what I'm talking about. But there's a point in life that they're shameful of it, and they don't, and they won't, and they'll try to cover, they'll hide behind things and all, because there's a point in time, and there's association through the Word of God. Now, that may be different in different cultures and different things, and I'm not saying at that point that that's the biblical point, that they're lost and out of the special grace of God for a child, but I'm just saying there's, usually, there's a tie there, it seems to be, through the Word of God. But my point is, through the, scripturally so, that we know from a couple incidents in Scripture that we know that babies go to heaven. David declared that when Bathsheba's child with him died. But then there's the age that they know between, between good and evil. At that point on, they're lost. When they understand the law, they understand good and evil and realize that there's a problem. And they're separated from God. They're dead in sin, dead to God. And they're just simply awaiting that spiritually dead to God. They don't have knowledge of God. They don't have understanding with God. They're not enlightened of God. They're dead to God. And then there's a second death. When Adam disobeyed God, he said, surely you'll die. Well, he didn't fall over dead right there. But he had not, had he not sinned against that, Adam could very well be a member of this church and be here today. He'd be 6,001 years old or something like that. But he died. So this is, there's death, the physical death, but then there's a second death. And that's brought out in, Genesis, in Revelation chapter 20. 
when they stand before God, that dead without Christ are all brought before God, the great white throne judgment, and they'll bow their knees and declare that He is God right before they're cast off into the eternal lake of fire. And go back and read it. The Bible says, and this is the second death. They died once in the physical body. Went to hell, spent time in hell. And then at that day, they're going to be resurrected. Now, I've got a message somewhere I preached years ago on the worst day of a sinner's life. And ain't the day they got die and go to hell. But the day they're resurrected from hell, stand before him at the great white throne judgment, bow their knee, and they're cast off in the eternal lake of fire. Before that, there's some hope in their mind of getting out, and there is, they may not know it and understand it, but there is going to be a second they're going to be out of that intense heat. But it'll be just long enough to declare him God and be cast off in the etern- eternal lake of fire where death and hell will be. I'm just trying to say, if you don't know Jesus, you're, uh, you're, you're, dead, you're, you're dead to God, spiritually speaking. Uh, one day, if you don't get saved, you're going to die in your sin. There's a wage for that. You're dead to God, and then you're wait, really just awaiting physical death and waiting the second death. But, praise God, but God, thank God for the but gods and the word of God. Upon repentance, trust in Jesus Christ, turn into Christ for forgiveness. And there's more to repentance than that, but that's the nutshell of it. That person becomes a new creature. He has Jesus' righteousness applied to his account that was a account of wickedness. So the righteousness of Jesus imputed his account, and he has life, eternal life. He's alive to God, alive, and this book will make sense to you. Understand this book is a living book, by the way. Dead don't understand this. Oh, sure, they some parts are so obvious. Anybody could understand some parts, but I say that, but it tells real easy in the beginning of how, God, how the heaven and earth got here. God created it, but there's wise people go to college for years and years to declare that's not true, that somehow it come across cause two bodies of something that run into each other and banged and it all come out of that. That's the devil's religion. By the way, it is a religion. But at a person time, the sinner trusts Christ. That that I started off with, wandering around, searching for peace, searching for hope, searching for life. That comes alive to them. They're, they're alive in Christ. Romans 6, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end, everlasting life. So why? So when we're saved, our life, everything we do is fruit unto holiness, uh, laying up treasure for God, the works we do, and in, in, back to that song, Brother Good Song, in the name of Jesus, those things will be rewarded one day. The things we do in the name of Jim, in the name of Charles, they're not going to be rewarded, but those things done in the name of Jesus, they carry reward, they bear weight, eternal weight. And the end of that verse says, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end, eternal life. But then Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what? I never even got to the abundant, abundant part. But maybe that's worked out that way for a purpose. Might do that next Sunday. I don't know. Might do it Wednesday night. I don't know. I might preach a full message then we'll sing a bunch. Man, I've stayed at church at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night around piano singing. It'd do so good. You'd be surprised what it'd do for you. Oh, and I mean, had to get up next morning, 5, 6 o'clock, and go to work. You know what, let's, let's do stop it there. There's a, there's a part three. I, I will give you this. There's a part, the part A is the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. Part B is I come that they might have life. This morning I think the main focus needs to be on make sure that you have life, that you have eternal life. But then it goes on and says, as they, and they that might, well, I mean, and that they might have it more abundantly. 
So we'll hold that. We'll put the pause button on that abundance. I'm more concerned with you today. Do you know Christ is your Savior? You've probably heard me quote this before. You've probably heard people long before me say this. There'll be three surprises when you get to heaven. Or maybe we could say it this way. If you could stare into the gates of heaven right now, you'd be surprised three ways. You'd be surprised at who's there that you thought wouldn't be there. You'd be surprised at who ain't there that you thought would be there, and that's what scares me. And as much as I believe in a no-so salvation that I know I'm born again, I know what Christ did for me, and he said that, that when I trust in him and believe on him, believe for forgiveness of sin, that he's done that, and these things are written to me, know that you have eternal life. As much as I believe in a no-so salvation, I still believe when we really see him, when we see his face, face to face with the creator of the universe I believe we're going to be surprised ourselves too do you know Christ is your savior the part that scares me is those you thought be there that ain't there church membership don't cut it any office position whether it be toilet paper changer or pastor or song leader or Sunday school teacher, deacon, whatever that's not an entrance way to heaven. Being religious and doing good is not a ticket to heaven. There's only one way through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So he paid our sin debt on old bloody Calvary. He died in my stead and yours. He paid our sin debt that we might be free. And if you'd simply trust him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not have perished but have everlasting life, eternal life. Do you know him? Are you trusting in your, or are you trusting in being a good person, being kind of faithful down to the house of God? You know, I go enough to just keep my name in the hat that name don't get now out of salvation that way. But we are saved under good works. When we're saved, we ought to be faithful. And that's later on in the message from another angle. We'll spend some time on that. And if we're saved, folks, we ought to be affiliated with and faithful to a local church. That's how God designed the furtherance of the ministry and gospel. Through the local church. It's his hands and feet. And I know collectively make up the whole body of Christ. I know collectively do his work. But God works through the local church. Folks say, yeah, I'm saved. I just, I just don't believe in congregating. I don't believe going down there with them hypocrites and all that. What you probably don't believe is Jesus Christ for eternal life. And I know, I'm not saying if somebody's not faithful in church every week, they're lost. I didn't say that. But if you ain't got a desire to be in the house of God, you don't like God. You don't like them people out of church. Oh, that's pretty strong. Look what the Bible says about that. That we know by love for each other, we're known as being Christians. His children, our love for the brethren. Do you know Him today as your Savior? If you were to die right now, can you give me a Bible reason why you'd go to heaven? A Bible reason. Is there evidence in your life that you're a Christian? What do you need to do this morning? It's time of invitation. Don't leave here lost. Christians, won't you repent of that haphazard life of Christ and get in this altar and get right with God? What do you need to do today? How about if you just come play a song this morning, sister? I'm sorry. If you come up, just play a song. We're not going to sing this morning. What do you need to do? The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. We hadn't even got to the abundant part. We'll get there. Do you have life? Christian, is that life a life that reflects the glory of Jesus Christ? What do you need to do? Father, I pray that you'd have your way in this time of invitation. Work in hearts this morning. God, we love you. Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen.
play through one more verse, if you would, sister. Do you know that you know that you know? I'm not going to, but if I was to point at you and say, tell me about when you got saved. Tell me about it. Tell me, give me your salvation testimony. Do you have something to tell? If I were to say, how about this last week? Give me evidence. Tell me of something that you know that you're a saved person. You got something to tell? Could you give me a Bible verse to back your hope of salvation? Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ. Don't leave here lost. And then maybe you're here today and know Jesus, sure of it, but struggling. Do business with the Lord. Just turn to him. Draw nigh to him. He'll draw nigh to you. Thank you for your attention this morning. Appreciate our visitors. Appreciate y'all being here today. Hope you'll return again. It's just good to be in God's house. Appreciate our home folk. Uh, say good night. Uh, six o'clock. A little bit different service tonight. I'll, I'll preach just a few minutes and y'all saying, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> preach a few minutes, have some song, maybe a few testimonies and all. Just a little bit different service on fifth Sunday night and all. And I appreciate that. I love that. It's a lot about, about music and about singing and worshiping and song. Well, let's be dismissed from word of prayer. Brother Wayne, how about if you would dismiss some word of prayer, please, brother? Thank you enough for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. All God's children.